Hi, welcome to our new episode of Absolutely, Business Entrepreneur Stories. First part of the story. In this episode we will see the history of LVMH, one of the world's leading luxury goods conglomerates. LVMH, which stands for Louis Vuitton Mote Hennessy, was founded in 1987 through the merger of two French companies, Louis Vuitton, a luxury fashion house, and Mote Hennessy, a producer of fine wines and spirits. The merger was orchestrated by businessman Bernard Arnault, who had taken control of the struggling textile and construction company Boussac in 1984, which owned Louis Vuitton at the time. At this time, they start providing products ranging from champagne to perfumes to designer handbags. Its fashion and leather goods division includes such prominent brands as Louis Vuitton, Kenzo, Givenchy, and Celine, while its fragrance and cosmetics group distributes brands including Christian Dior, Givenchy, and Guerlain. LVMH's wine and spirits group includes such premium brands as Dom Perignon, Hennessy, Krug, and Mot Chandon. The company also owns luxury retailers, including a majority stake in DFS Group Limited, a group of duty-free stores, and Sephora, a cosmetics and perfume chain. The company sought to expand and diversify in the late 1990s through a number of acquisitions. Who was Louis Vuitton? Historically a supplier of luggage to the wealthy and powerful, Louis Vuitton is known for combining quality fabrication with innovative designs to reflect the needs of customers and the ever-changing modes of world travel. Louis Vuitton left Anchi, his birthplace in the Jura, for Paris in 1835 at age 14. After one year of traveling on foot, he reached the capital and soon became an apprentice packer and trunk maker. The son of a carpenter, Vuitton mastered the skill of woodworking and designing trunks and, within 10 years, had become an expert. During his apprenticeship, Vuitton gained experience in packing by traveling to the homes of wealthy women, where he was employed to pack their clothes before they embarked on long voyages. With his master, Monsieur Marichal, Vuitton went regularly to the Tilleries Palace as the exclusive packers to the Empress Eugenie and her ladies-in-waiting. In 1854, Vuitton opened his own business at 4 Rue Neuve de Capucines, very close to the couture houses around Place Vendôme. Due to his familiarity with wood, silk, and satin, he became well respected by the couturiers, who hired him to pack their creations. His invention of flat-top trunks, which were more easily stacked for travel than the traditional dome trunks, established his reputation as a master luggage maker. Vuitton began covering his trunks in grey trinan canvas, which was both elegant and waterproof when varnished. As the business grew increasingly successful, Vuitton built workshops outside Paris in Asnières, where transportation of wood from the south was convenient. When his original store became too small, business was transferred to one rue scribe, and Vuitton began focusing on trunk making rather than packing. Vuitton became the supplier of luggage to many of the most famous people of the era, from King Alfonso XII of Spain to the future Tsar Nicholas II of Russia. He created special trunks for Ismail Pasha, the Viceroy of Egypt, for the inauguration of the Suez Canal as well as a trunk bed for Savornian de Braza, who discovered the source of the Congo in 1876. The quality of the materials, the arrangement of interiors, and the finishings made Vuitton's deluxe trunks far superior to anything that had previously been produced. In an attempt to discourage copying of the Trinan Grey canvas in 1876, Vuitton introduced new designs featuring red and beige stripes and brown and beige stripes to cover his trunks. By 1888, these striped canvases were imitated, and a patented checkered material was implemented. A large part of the company's success was its ability to respond to the changing modes of travel which emerged at an astonishing rate in the second half of the 19th century. Vuitton designed classic wardrobe trunks for sleeping cars and lighter versions of the suitcase traditionally used by the English aristocracy. His son Georges played an important role in the managing of the business, opening the first Vuitton branch abroad in London in 1885. In 1890, Georges invented the theft-proof five-tumbler lock, which provided each customer with a personal combination to secure all his luggage. Two years later, the company's first catalogue presented a wide range of products, 
from very specialized trunks for transporting particular objects to simple bags with the typical traveler in mind. For years after the death of Louis Vuitton in 1892, Georges introduced a new canvas design in another attempt to thwart counterfeiters. In memory of his father, Georges' new design featured Louis Vuitton's initials against a background of stars and flowers, it was patented and became an immediate success. Traveling to America for the Chicago Exposition of 1893, Georges became convinced of the importance of a sales network abroad. By the end of the century, John Wanamaker began representing Louis Vuitton in New York and Philadelphia, and the London store was transferred to New Bond Street, in the heart of London's luxury commerce. The company also expanded its distribution to Boston, Chicago, San Francisco, Brussels, Buenos Aires, Nice, Bangkok, and Montreal in the early 20th century. Georges also foresaw the importance of the automobile as a form of transport and began designing automobile trunks, which imitated the lines of the car, to protect travelers' effects from rain and dust. Contending that one should be able to take in a car what one could take on a boat or train, he created ice boxes, canteens, and light and flexible steamer bags. Other efforts to adapt to the changes in the travel industry included the manufacture of airplane and hot air balloon trunks and cases for spare tires. In 1914, the company erected a new building on the Champs-Élysées as the center for its growing network of distribution, this store became the world's largest retailer of travel goods. During World War I, production was modified to the needs of the war effort, as simple and solid military trunks replaced delicate and luxurious models. Part of the factory in Asniers produced folding stretchers which were loaded directly into ambulances leaving for the front. With the 1918 German offensive 60 kilometers from Paris, Georges had difficulty supplying his factory with materials and assuring the safety of his workers. After the war, the Vuittons struggled to supply their stores with what remained of the factory. Although the company supplied Prince Yusupov with a jewel case to transport precious stones to America before the Bolshevik Revolution, such personal orders were less common after the war, and the factory devoted more time to producing showcases for traveling salesmen. As economic times improved, and Louis Vuitton regained its stylish clientele, special orders increased. The workshop at Asniers worked to produce orders for Coco Chanel, the Aga Khan, Mary Pickford, the Vanderbilts, and the President of the French Republic, among others. Charles Lindbergh ordered two suitcases from Vuitton for his return trip to America after his famous flight to France. During this time, the company provided some packing services for foreigners who came to buy garments from the Paris Couture collections. In the early 1930s, exoticism was in vogue, and Vuitton used tortoise shell, lizard skin, ebony, and unusual woods in its fabrications. As economic conditions deteriorated worldwide, however, the Vuittons realized the necessity of increasing the company's profitability. Georges' son, Gaston, worked with his father to increase efficiency. An advertising agency was set up and a design office was created to make detailed sketches of products to show customers before fabrication. By the time Georges Vuitton died in 1936, special orders had dramatically declined, and the company's sales depended more than ever upon its catalog offerings, which were expanded to include trunks for typewriters, radios, books, rifles, and wine bottles. During World War II, when delivery of Vuitton products was curtailed, overseas contracts were terminated, and the Vuitton factory and stores closed. The post-war period involved resupplying the stores, rebuilding business to pre-war levels, and restructuring operations. Three of Gaston's sons played important roles, Henry in commercial management, Jacques in financial administration, and Claude in factory management. The first important post-war order at the company was for the President of the Republic, Vincent Oriol, who made an official visit to the United States. In 1954, the company's 100th anniversary, Louis Vuitton moved from the Champs-Élysées to Avenue Marceau. As travel times were cut with the development of trains, cars, and airplanes, the company created and improved its soft-sided luggage. In 1959, Gaston perfected a system of coating his motif canvases, making them more durable, waterproof, and suitable for shorter journeys. 
These lightweight, practical bags signified a new standard in luggage. Gaston invited well-known artists to take part in the design of accessories. From 1959 to 1965, an average of 25 new models of Vuitton luggage were created each year. With the company's success and reputation for luxury came a vast wave of counterfeit Louis Vuitton products. One year before his death in 1970, Gaston Vuitton decided to take action against the counterfeiters by opening a store in Tokyo, by offering the real Vuitton product in the Asian market, he hoped to better inform customers and discourage the purchase and manufacture of imitations. The company also undertook a successful advertising campaign to battle the increase in counterfeiting. Henry Rackemeyer, the husband of Gaston Vuitton's daughter Odile, took over management of the company in 1977. Rackemeyer had founded Stinix, a steel manufacturing business, after the Second World War and had sold it at a huge profit before coming to Louis Vuitton. Under Rackemeyer, the company's sales soared from $20 million in 1977 to nearly $1 billion in 1987. Rackemeyer recognized that the major profits were in retail and that to succeed on an international level, Louis Vuitton had to expand its presence in stores and distributors in France. As a result, Louis Vuitton stores were opened all over the world between 1977 and 1987, and Asia became the company's principal export market. Moreover, product diversification ensued, and in 1984, at the urging of financial director Joseph Lafont, the company sold stock to the public through exchanges in Paris and New York. The 1980s were profitable years for Louis Vuitton, as the Vuitton name was prodigiously promoted. In 1983, Louis Vuitton became the sponsor of the America's Cup preliminaries. Three years later, the company created the Louis Vuitton Foundation for Opera and Music. Also in 1986, the central Paris store moved from Avenue Marceau to the Poche Avenue Montaigne. Production at the factory at Asnières incorporated the use of lasers and other modern technology during this time, and a distribution center was opened at Sergi Pontoise, north of Paris. The company allocated 2% of annual sales revenue to the unending battle against counterfeiters. Under Rackemeyer, Louis Vuitton began to acquire companies with a reputation for high quality, purchasing interests in the Couturier Givenchy and the Champagne House Beauf Cliquot. Louis Vuitton's takeover philosophy was personal, courteous, and discreet, rather than systematically aggressive. Thanks for watching this story and I hope you enjoyed the history of LVMH and its success attributed to the focus on quality, innovation, and craftsmanship, as well as its ability to adapt to changing consumer trends and market conditions. If you liked the video, don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to help this channel grow. Absolutely, inspiring business and entrepreneur stories. So, what's your story?